regular meeting of the Littleton City Council to order on April 16, 2024. Uh, city Clerk, well, City Attorney, uh, would you do the roll call, please? Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, Council Member Reichert? Here. Council Member Grove? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Barr? Here. Uh, Council Member Peters? Here. Council Member Ryden? Here. And Council Member Driscoll? Here. Mayor Schlachter. I am also present. We have a quorum. Thank you. All right, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, next up on our agenda is approval of the agenda. Council, everyone's had a chance to review said agenda. Any changes? See no changes. The agenda is approved without objection. Item four tonight is uh, our public comment period. Uh, public comment, uh, a time for members of our community to express opinions uh, regarding issues that are not part of, our, of public hearings. Uh, we have none of them tonight. Um, each speaker will be limited to three minutes. We expect uh, comments to be civil. When you hit your three-minute mark, I'll let you know. Uh, council is not authorized by open meeting laws to take action at this meeting by any on any issue raised by public comment that's not part of tonight's agenda. I may refer matters to the deputy city manager or city attorney for immediate comment um, or to go to staff to come back with additional information uh, later. Um, we've got a bunch of people signed up for public comment here. I think there are some people here from Meadowwood and Woolhurst, and I'm just going to ask the deputy city manager to um, uh, give a little bit of update. He was going to give it in the city manager update report, just in case there are any questions that people might pose. I think he has some um, things we just want to say to that. So, Thanks, Mayor. I've, I've had a, a chance just a little bit to visit with a number of the people who are visiting tonight, and uh, um, appreciate the chance to give you this update um, that might help inform some of the comments. Um, we want to let the council know that we have been following up on the citizen interests and council member questions heard at the April 2nd uh, council meeting about the situation at the Meadowwood community. Um, staff has been working to contact residents who appeared before council to understand their specific needs and requests of the city. And we have connected with and visited with several of them. We've also been researching financial options and partnership opportunities through the means available to the city. We heard questions about land use regulation and rental assistance that we're also researching. We know that time is short to respond to the residents about any potential assistance. So we are planning to bring a more complete update to the council as part of the city manager's report at your next meeting on April 23rd. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll go through the list of the uh, 13 people that have signed up and then if there's additional people that would like to speak that didn't have a chance to sign up, we can get to you at the end of this. Uh, first up, we have Chuck Johnson. And if you could please state your name for the record and address or district uh, into the mic, thanks. My name is Chuck Johnson. I live at 6705 South Santa Fe Drive. Mr. Mayor, council members, and other distinguished guests. As I stated, my name is Chuck Johnson. I'm a resident of Meadowwood Village. I'm here to represent my neighbors but more specifically my fellow veterans who reside in our park. I myself am a disabled veteran of the United States Marine Corps. A survey conducted by HUD found that in 2023, the number of homeless vets in our country increased by 7.4% to 35,574. This is one third of all the adult homeless in our country. Some of our fellow veterans paid the ultimate price. Some of us just sacrificed our health Ask why we did what we did, and we'll tell you. We did it because you and your loved ones are worth it. And if asked again, we'd do it again. Please look into your hearts and in the budget and help my fellow vets and me from adding to the homeless statistics. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, next up, we have Scott Russell. Good evening, Mayor, Councilman. My name is Scott Russell, 9362 Logia Street. I'm here with United Sovereigns. It's a volunteer service. Um, we're looking at the voter rolls across the entire United State and also the United States. We have some uh, um, egregious numbers that have been pulled off the Colorado um, 
Secretary of State's website. These numbers have been uh, analyzed by forensic um, scientists, computer scientists. This is a resolution for a legally valid 2024 general election. Whereas it is recognized the civil right in the United States for every citizen to have a free and fair elections, and the right of suffrage can be denied by the debasement or the dilution of that weight of a citizen's vote just as effectively as by wholly prohibiting the free exercise of this franchise. Whereas it is a duty of our elected officials to guarantee our elections are accurate, free from distortion or manipulation, Congress seeks to guard the election of members of Congress against any possible unfairness by compelling everyone concerning and holding the election to a strict, scrupulous observance of every duty devolved upon him while so engaged. The evil intent consists of disobedience of the law, and that was in COI 127 of the U.S. Constitution, whereas our constitutional system, representative government, only works when the following of four tenets of the election are upheld. The voter rolls must be accurate per the National Voter Roll Act of 1993. The votes counted must be from eligible voters, U.S. Constitution of the 14th Amendment, Section 2. The number of votes counted must equal the number of votes who, voters who voted. There can be no more than one in 125,000 ballots in error in the voting system per the Help America Act of 2002. Whereas, upon open source of the audit of the 2020 general election conducted by the Colorado State Citizens has uncovered evidence of a massive inaccuracies. 1,468,211 ineligible votes, uncertain registration violations found within the Colorado State Voter Roll database. Over 100,938 votes were cast by ineligible, uh, uncertain registrants. 34,912 more votes were counted than voters who voted in the 2022 general election, and nobody knows who count casted them. 100,917 apparent voting violations in excess of legal standards of the system of accuracy for federal election, maximum allow errors would have, in the 22 would have been only 21. Certification as defined by the law and its attestation of accuracy and compliance appears to have been fraudulent and illegal. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Next up, we have Mark Dennis. <clears throat> Thank you, Council. This is Mark Dennis. I've been a resident of Littleton for almost 55 years and a proud resident here. And I'm uh, glad to be before you here. I'm going to continue with what um, uh, Scott already started with, um, with this resolution. So this goes with, whereas these findings trample legal accuracy requirements of the voting system during a federal election, accuracy is defined as the ability of the system to capture and report the specific selections and absence of selections made by a voter without error. Whereas the intent of the voters must be known factually before certification can be lawfully conducted, certification of an election that varies from the law is an abridgment of the civil rights of the citizens, i.e. fraud ab initio. And this is from United States versus Throckmorton back in the U.S. Constitution 98, U.S. 61, 1878. From time <coughs> immemorial, an election to public office has been in point of substance no more and no less than the expression by qualified electors of their choice of candidates, i.e. United States versus Classic, 313 U.S. 299 in 1941. Whereas Colorado's 2022 general election appears to have been invalid, depriving us of the guaranteed protection of our national rights under a government duly and provably chosen by us, the American people, <clears throat> resulting in incalculable damage to our families, our way of life, and the fabric of these United States. Therefore, we call upon our representatives to provide relief to the people and the insurance of domestic tranquility by joining us in demanding a valid 2024 general election, as Scott noted, that upholds these existing laws and equitable principles of law. Number one, there's about 11 items here, and I'll cover the first four of these. Proof of citizenship and identity to register and vote, not anonymous attestation. Documented chain of custody on every ballot, regardless of entry source, maintained from voter to vote count, 
to final canvas. Number three, secure ballots similar to currency where imaging technology is used for technology, is used for tabulation, sorry, the security features must be verifiable in the image. And number four, voter rolls certified accurate 30 days before the start of early voting. Voters added after that date must bring proof of citizenship, identity, and address in person to a qualified official at each polling place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ness. Next up, we have Esther Scott. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Esther Scott and a resident of Littleton, Colorado in Arapahoe County, and I'm going to continue where Mark left off. Um, number five on the list and the resolution. Systems, machines, security measures, procedures, infrastructure, policy, and conduct are required to be compliant with the law regarding certification, testing, operational validation, and operational implementation. Any breach will require an adequately strong audit to verify measured outcomes were within 10% of the margin of victory at a 95% probability. The next one, a scientifically randomized audit of real ballots must be performed and meaningfully witnessed, proving the error rate is smaller than 10% of the margin victory. Otherwise, a fully witnessed hand recount must be performed. All parties, more than 10 um, all parties with more than 10% of the vote shall have full and effective observation rights. Next, election operations and systems must maintain end-to-end -end chain of custody from voter to vote count to final canvas, including audibility and witnessed transfer with paper records. Also, adjudication must be signed off by party witnesses and candidate witnesses with full and effective, effective observation rights. Candidates must be allowed immediate access to ballots, images, and CVRs. Um, candidates may agree to use party witnesses solely at their discretion. Um, also, end-to-end -end audit audits must be allowed by qualified, insured, and bonded security, forensics, and financial auditors. These shall not be personal from within the election system. Reconciliation will include the vote count, ballots, adjudication, CVRs, ballot count, voter count, custody transfer, and all other paper and electronic systems, including system logs if applicable. The aggrieved party must be allowed to select their own auditor. If the total of all unique variances above is more than 10% of the margin victory, a new election must be held in the state for those candidates affected, unless it can be provably corrected by a manual hand recount with a full review of records. Waiver of requirements is not allowed. Only end-to-end -end system compliance can guarantee the intent of the people is accurately recorded. Just obey the law. And so the resolution on the, um, that we have is, be it resolved that the Littleton City Council stands in support with the concerns and remedies presented here. We implore the Arapahoe County Commissioners, Colorado Legislature, federal legislators, law enforcement, federal and state prosecutors, judges, and both state and county boards of elections to cooperate and fulfill these firm requests of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Andreas. I cannot read the last name. Looks like it starts with an S. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jonathan Slater. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Jonathan Slater. I moved to Littleton in 2013. I live in District 3 near Euclid Middle School. I'm an LPS parent, and my family relies on walking, biking, public transit, and occasional car usage to get around Littleton. And Beyond, uh, this evening I'd like to address a concern on West Euclid Avenue. Uh, West Euclid Avenue runs between Broadway and Alati. This uh, half mile stretch of neighborhood street is well marked with the painted bike lane and prominent no parking bike lane signs on the north side of the street. Uh, the street is also part of a safe route to school for Euclid Middle School and Options High School. Yet a persistent issue with the street is vehicular obstruction that hinders walking, rolling, and cyclist safety. 
Um, in between Euclid Middle School and Options High School is a beloved, well-used community field that brings a lot of guests. It's great to see these public spaces thrive and bring people in our community together. However, this is the heart of the problem. Uh, the designated bike lane on the north side of Euclid Avenue is persistently obstructed by cars parked there during peak hours, such as school drop-off pickup times, after school activities, and weekend sports events. Compounding this issue, oversized vehicles often find themselves unable to fit within the confines of the bike lane. Consequently, these vehicles park upon the already narrow 30-inch side, 33-inch sidewalk, obstructing passage, forcing those walking, rolling, and biking to merge with vehicular traffic to navigate around these obstacles. Additionally, these cars are frequently parked on or in front of the crosswalks, a violation of the state law which mandates a 20-foot clearance from crosswalks for parked vehicles. Despite the diligent reports of these infractions through the LPD non-emergency channels as instructed in these chambers, uh, enforcement has been inconsistent, yielding limited tangible results. And I understand the constraints faced by law enforcement prioritizing calls, uh, but the persistent disregard for traffic regulations, including the police vehicles that are stationed there almost daily in the designated bike lane parked in front of the no parking bike lane sign undermines this collective safety efforts of the Safer Streets Littleton campaign. It's imperative that the police lead by example, aligning with the promise made by the Safer Streets Littleton campaign. I'm not asking to ticket neighbors, but to educate, enforce the rules for cars, and build infrastructure that promotes safety for walking, rolling, and biking neighbors. To truly grasp the challenges faced by our community in navigating our neighborhoods without cars, I would extend an invitation to the members of council and city staff to uh, walk around with me on these streets and witness firsthand the obstacles and opportunities presented in our neighborhoods. In closing, I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Slater. Uh, next up is Sandy Cook. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Sandy Cook. I am the Operations Manager of Meadowood Cooperative. When thinking of what I wanted to say tonight, I thought about Elaine's eloquent speech she gave last time she addressed the Council. She mentioned raising rents had impacted her life over the last 25 years, how she has given up her lifeline, her life insurance, enjoying a meal out so that she can cover the rate increases. Her story is not unique. When rate goes up for those of us on a fixed income, you have to sacrifice somewhere else. This will be our reality if we do not purchase the land that is under our homes and have control over the rent increases. You can't buy a new pair of shoes even though you need them. You can't buy your grandchildren a birthday gift you really wanted to and must purchase something less expensive. When there is a storm, you have uh, the worry that you just canceled your home insurance and pray that the damage is not uh, major. You hope the furnace doesn't quit when it's 10 degrees outside. When it does work or stop working, you don't ask yourself, when will the repairman get here? You ask, what will I have to do without to pay the bill? This will be the existence if Haven Park is allowed to purchase our park. A predatory mega out-of-state out corporation, a park owner that is known to double rents, cancel our 30-day leases if you're asking questions they don't like. This is the kind of landowner you will be allowing into our city. The newest political buzzword is affordable housing. Not a day goes by you don't hear it on the news. Politicians say, we need affordable housing. There is not enough affordable housing. We support affordable housing. This is your time to stand behind these words. The city of Denver gave $2.6 million forgivable loan to save a mobile home park and avoided the displacement of its residents. The city of Lafayette, along with Boulder County, was able to help a park with $1.5 million. The city of Golden, Cortez, Longmont, Canyon City, Johnstown have all contributed money to save mobile home parks and keep affordable housing. Our cooperative cannot do this without a grant from the city of Littleton. We cannot do it alone. We will only succeed with your help. I also want to take the time to thank Andrea Peters, who has been involved in our effort to buy the park from the start, attended meetings, researched options, and has been a great supporter. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Cook. 
<laughs> Next up is Pam Chadbourne. Good evening, Council. I'm Pam Chadbourne. I live a block and a half from here. So um, <clears throat> it's great to have uh, company during public comment. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I don't agree about election integrity, and we can disagree and, uh, and still speak. And so I'm glad about that. Um, I want to mention when I grew up, um, Murray Armstrong, the coach of the DU Pioneers, and his family lived next door to my, my family. We were much younger kids than their son, but the DU Pioneers just won the 10th NCAA hockey championship and broke the record. And Mr. Armstrong, Coach Armstrong, lived here in Littleton for a while. So let's be proud of that. And folks, I think there's a lot of stuff that we don't know happened. Most of you don't know what happened. But we had a hand in part of, you know, this history. I think some of those championships, he won five, by the way. He coached the team to five of those ten victories. So, um, you know, just be aware. That's part of our history um, a little bit, too. Um, the county line road change is interesting to me. When I was a kid, my dad could drive his Buick and create a little false, a little sense of weightlessness over the hill. That was fixed. You can't do that anymore. Don't recommend driving that way. But I'm going to mention something. The two-lane expansion, what does that do to the safety of the road? Do you all know? Does our staff prepare a checklist about the impacts of these changes other than the simple, very narrow focus on the financial impact? No. And we should know that before you all are asked to make this decision and before we are impacted by it. So I'd like to know what the safety of that change is. I don't know. And you can hear that, you know, transit safety is important to a lot of people. Um, I do not understand the impact to the city of the exclusion of a property from the Santa Fe uh, Metro District. I do not understand that impact. Again, I would like staff to bring, not just you, but the public, um, a better description of the impact of these changes before you're asked to approve them. That really is your job. You are voted to be our representatives to perform work. It's unpleasant, I acknowledge that, of due diligence on our parts. So I would like to see that kind of checklist for something like this. Finally, almost out of time, but uh, Meadowood should be preserved. And I'm glad that our deputy city manager said they're working on it. I want to hear what the city can do. I want an evaluation of what that can be done. I think we can do city, county, state and South Metro housing options. And there's probably a couple other ones that I don't know about. Please, thank you for doing that. Thank you, Pam. Uh, next up we have, it looks like Sherry DeQuinzio. I run out of breath when I'm trying to talk, so. Good evening, council members and mayor, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Sherry DeQuinzio. I am the vice president of Meadowood Cooperative. Prior to moving into Meadowood Mobile Home Park in 2020, I owned and lived in several different houses in the Lakewood and Denver areas, the most recent of which was my son's basement. But I had never lived in a mobile home and was a bit apprehensive. After buying my lovely modern modular home in Meadowood, I soon discovered this particular park had a lot to offer. Of all the neighborhoods I've lived in, Meadowood is honestly the first place I have felt actually a part of a community that cares about and helps their neighbors and watches out for each other. At my other neighborhoods, even though I could have been there for several years, I hardly knew my neighbors' names Everyone seemed to be very guarded and kept to themselves. At Meadowood, I feel like I belong, I feel safe, that I matter, which is something that is not easy to come by for a single senior woman. Um, I have worked my entire life, raised two great kids, both in the healthcare field. I retired from Denver Health after 30 years, but can't afford to stay retired, so I'm still working part-time at Rocky Mountain Human Services. Meadowood was intended to be my last home, 
providing me with affordable senior housing so that I could finally travel and do some of the fun things I worked so hard all my life to be able to do. If Haven Park becomes our new owner, most of us will be forced to leave. So where do we go? It's not like there's lots of other parks we could just pick up and move our homes to, especially ones not as nice as Meadowood. My teenage granddaughter moved into my son's basement, so I can't go back there. My daughter and her husband live in a tiny apartment and are working hard to buy a house, but the housing market puts a mother-in-law apartment, or tiny home, out of reach. Meadowood is the poster child for what's going on right now with building and maintaining affordable housing, very little of which is focused on seniors, by the way. We are the hardworking, retired citizens, veterans, disabled, and low-income seniors who have contributed throughout our lives and now we need to be paid attention to. We need the city of Littleton's help to stay in our homes and not become a burden to our families and ultimately the cities we are forced to move to because we'll need various government assistance to survive and stay off the streets. Thank you to Andrea Peters for your support and guidance. We greatly appreciate it, but now we need a commitment to the money to move forward with the ability to stay in our homes and flourish. Thank you, Ms. Ms. DeQuinzio. Next up, we have David Stouter. Thank you, council members. My name is David Stouter. I live at Meadowood Village Senior Community, located at 6705 South Santa Fe Drive, Littleton, Colorado. The community is located just north of uh, Breckenridge Brewery off Brewery Lane. Um, we're asking for your help. This kind of help not only makes the news, but it makes history. Most importantly, it helps people. This is the kind of help we're asking you for. If you will help us own our own community, it will be a great impact on the future of Littleton. We're not asking for development funds, rather the opportunity to just keep something that's already there. Meadowood is a place for seniors to live comfortably Cost of goods and services, including rent, are on the rise faster than ever. We want to keep our residents at Meadowood. Our community is affordable. Now it won't be in just 12 months. We're asking for $2.6 million from the city. This can be in a promissory note. Just to get the ball rolling with our nonprofit group. We're in a time crunch. Together with Rapo County, the development of local affairs, DOLA, we can make this happen. We want to run our community. We want to keep the land in Littleton for Littleton locals. We hear all the time about affordable housing in the news. Unfortunately, there are no laws to protect homeowners from landlords from raising rent on senior mobile homes, uh, mobile home communities. We have 92 homes, 121 retired citizens, most of which are fixed on fixed income, relying on social security, retirement, material, uh, military pensions. Please help us get the ball rolling. Subsidies can come from grants, loans, forgivable loans, and even 99 year loans. There are many opportunities, we just need to work together to find them. These practices have already been proven in similar communities in the state of Colorado. We just need to find them. We need the city's help with resources and your guidance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Stutter. <clears throat> Next up is Elaine Davies. Good evening, my name is Elaine Davies. I live in Meadowood as well as all of these people behind me. As you know, and it's been mentioned, there is a need for affordable housing for senior citizens. We are in that category. 
To me, the name senior citizen is very generic. I would like to have you think of us a little differently. Think of your family and look at us as someone else's grandparents that need your help. You have heard before that being a grandparent is great, but being able to send grandkids back their, to their parents is even greater. Maybe the reverse is also true. Grandparents attend birthdays and graduations, other family gatherings, etc. Parents count on sending them back to their homes as well. Some of us may have to leave our homes for health reasons. You can't do anything about that. But you can do something about us having to leave our homes and independence because of financial reasons like having very high rates. Last meeting, I told you about the things I have done to be able to afford to afford my rent, such as lunches. Last week, I treated myself to lunch. Yes, I did go to McDonald's. Yes, I did order a kid's meal. Yes, it had a toy in it. The cost was $6.69. I would love at some point, and this is not on my page, to be, to be able to go to McDonald's and order from the regular list. I ask again, think of us as someone's grandparent, not just another senior citizen. Please help us. Thank you, Ms. Davies. <clears throat> Next up is uh, Raina Brichetto. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Raina Brichetto. I live at 2841 West Long Drive in Littleton. And my question is only about Costco. Um, I went to the meeting that was held at Bemis Library on Saturday, I believe it was the 6th of April. And I thought that Costco was a done deal. Uh, I attended a meeting last Thursday that Costco put on at Mission Hills Church, and they indicated that they still need final approval. So I am part of a newsletter for our community, and I want to put out accurate information. So is it a done deal? Does it need yet another approval? That's my only question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, last up on the signed up list is Keely Quinn. Uh, good evening, Council and staff. Um, my name is Keely Quinn, and I live in District 2. Um, before I get into what I had written, I just want to say, as a recipient of an affordable home buying program in Littleton, I strongly stand with the people of Meadowood who are here tonight, and I hope that we can help them stay in their homes. Um, <laughs> you've heard from me in the past as a vocal supporter of improving safety on our roads. And I'm here again tonight to, on that same subject. Um, I love the area that we all live in with all of the access to trails and the small community feel. But all of that requires better safety for biking, walking, and rolling on roads to access. You can't get to a trail without being on the road. Um, I know that we are about to begin the search for a new director of public works. And I'm here to urge city council to push staff to focus on hiring someone with a vision for a safer and vibrant Littleton. I have big dreams for our city and I want our leadership to share them. So to council and then our city manager, who's not here tonight, but um, please fill this important role with someone who can guide our city through upcoming changes such as Project Downtown with creativity and a fresh set of eyes focused on keeping those walking and biking safe. I believe that as we make improvements to our roads with bikers, walkers, and rollers in mind, it'll improve the experience for drivers as well. I'm not asking to remove cars from our city, but to help create a safe multimodal city. Additionally, I wanna take a moment to thank council for listening to our calls for safer streets. I know that this is a long journey and I'm happy to be on it with you. And before I leave, one quick note, um, 
we are starting a farmer's market on Nevada Street, just north of Maine. It'll be on the first and third Sundays starting in May and running through October. And we would love to see you there. Have a great night. Thank you. Uh, so that's all the people we have signed up ahead of time. Are there any other people in the audience that would like to speak to council? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Reiner, when you come up, please state your name and address or district for the record. If you just, if anyone else here want to get, gets in line, go ahead and get in line behind that gentleman. We can move that that way. My name is Nancy Stoniker, and I'm 74. I have lived in Meadowood, uh, Lot 57, for 12 years. I live with my two cats, Chloe, Chloe and Lucy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not a very good speaker. <laughs> Uh, I was laid off in 2009 when we had a downturn in the economy. I was a human resource administrator for most of my career. No one was hiring. Plus, I wasn't a youngster anymore. I stayed on unemployment for a while, but it wasn't much money, and I got bored. It was the first time I'd ever been on unemployment. The only job I could get was in retail at Walmart. I have never worked in re retail before, but there's always a first time for everything. I also early retired at 62 to help supplement my income. I bought and paid for my mobile home in 2011, and I thought if I could just, just had my lot rent that I'd be able to make it. And, but the lot rent has gone up since then. Now that in inflation is so bad, I am finding it really hard to make ends meet. Every time I turn around, one of my bills goes up. I pride myself on being a good budgeter, but now I'm struggling. If our rent goes up a lot, I'm not sure I will be able to make it on my own. I'm only working 14 hours a week now because it's really hard on my body. I have recently been forced to take a leave of absence due to health reasons. I find myself in the position that I may not be able to return to work. I'm sorry. I really enjoy getting out and talking to people, plus it's the extra income. If we are purchased by a large corporation, they will only look at their bottom line, not at my neighbors or myself. If we owned Meadowood, we could take pride in taking care of what's ours. My neighbors are also my friends, and we all try to help each other out if something needs to be done. If you help us to purchase Meadowood, you will be helping seniors, the disabled, and veterans. Please help us all to keep our independence and our dignity. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I should say, if you want to speak, you don't have to stand in line for the whole time. You can get up when there's only one or two people there. I was just letting you know, so I don't have to point at names. <laughs> Good evening. I promise I'll be very brief and to the point, but I thank you for your time. My name is Richard Brees, and my wife is over here. Nancy and I live in Meadowwood community. I'm an Army veteran, and we both live on a fixed income, as many of us do. And I know some mobile home parks may have a bad reputation, but ours is not one of those. We at Meadowwood take great pride in our community and continually contribute to this city. We care deeply about one another, and we are relying on you to stand up for us, so please do. This is a land grab attempt from outsiders to take over our community. They have a very bad reputation nationwide. We have organized a cooperative and we want to buy our own park and continue to be a part of the fabric of Littleton. Yes, we are the elderly, gulp, <laughs> and we have spent our very lives investing in one another. We represent you and your families, and in turn, you represent us. One day, you or your loved ones may be in our shoes. And we hope and pray no one will ever turn their backs on you. 
We are the kind of people that care about others. We are depending on you to step up and give us the help and support that we desperately need. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Brees. Hi, my name is Sandy Lai. My husband and I have lived in Meadowood for nine years, but we've lived in Littleton for 30 years. Um, I invite all of you to come to Meadowood and see what a wonderful community we have and how we care about each other. Everybody cares about everybody else. We have a little coffee group at, in Meadowood and every Monday morning we make a lot of coffee, we bring treats, we get together, we talk about um, what people need in the community. We have Irma, our little sweetheart, that is 92 years old and she leads a meeting every Monday and she we talk about what people need. You're if making her blush back there. I know. <laughs> she, um, we talk about uh, if someone needs a ride to, to a doctor, if they need help, if they need something fixed, and everybody helps everybody else. And then Irma gets up and tells jokes <laughs> and sends us off for a great week. Um, at Meadowood, we feel like we're really part of the Littleton community. Uh, last weekend, we had a wonderful church group that came and helped some of the seniors with things that they couldn't do. They washed windows and raked leaves and they cleaned gutters and and uh, we have uh, we have several people in in the community in Meadowood that go to a food pantry at St. Mary's Church. Um, we have, we have visits from the Bemis Library, Bookmobile. So we, we really do feel like we're part of the community and a lot of us belong to the Buck Center. Um, we love so many things about Littleton and we really wanna stay in this community. Um, my husband and I have always been proud to be from Littleton. And in the past 30 years, every time we've reached out to the city of Littleton, We've gotten the assistance that we needed, and we've been treated like valuable, respected citizens. So please don't let us down this time. Thank you, Ms. Lai. <clears throat> we have a good picture here. My name is Bob Crossman, and uh, I'm also a resident of Meadowood Village. I'm 77 years old, and as you can guess, I'm probably gonna tell you exactly what folks have already told you. We need your support. Um, I live in Meadowood Village because I need affordable housing, and that is what it provides. I'm a veteran. I volunteered to serve my country from 1966 to 1970 in the Air Force. I've never asked for government assistance before, in any form or fashion, but we are here again to ask for your help. That is what we need. Um, you're looking at a lot of folks. It could be your dad, your grandfather. Um, we talk about affordable housing. It's critical to us. Uh, there's a lot more I could say, but I think you get to just it. We seriously need your help. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Patrick Gruenwald. Uh, I'm uh, at Meadowood as well. Uh, first of all, I wanted to tell you guys thank you so very much for the job you did last week, uh, last time I was here. I think it was two weeks ago. You guys did a great job. Uh, I got to share the, uh, the YouTube video with family and uh, different people and they got to see how, how well this whole group works. Uh, <coughs> Who else is in Meadowood? I'm a, I tell people uh, that I'm going to be 50 in two weeks. Now, that's a lie, but I tell them that anyways. I'm actually going to be 60 in a year. So I'm over 55, but not much. I'm still working. I'm a blue-collar worker. Uh, I live with my wife there. 
Uh, we have two kids, but they're in other states. Uh, I've made a comfortable living blue collar work, working in factories, uh, one income. Uh, my wife hasn't ever worked. Uh, uh, I'm still doing pretty good. Uh, one thing I love about uh, Meadowood, well, is that it is Littleton, first of all. Uh, I've been in Littleton since the 80s, well, since the 70s, actually. Uh, went to Damon Runyon uh, Elementary School. And then we moved to Pennsylvania, and my dad liked Littleton so much we moved back. So uh, I've been across the railroad tracks from Meadowwood on Prince Street for like 40 years. Uh, I joined the Army in 1986, moved out of the state. Uh, I'm also a Desert Storm veteran. I also have a, uh, a disability, which is directly related to Desert Storm. Um, but I am not disabled. Uh, I work for a living. I want to be able to retire. Uh, we feel like we're being shysted by the, uh, by the banks. We feel like the, the banks are, are just knocking the heck out of us. Uh, uh, I ride my bicycle to work every day. It's 13 miles. Keeps my heart beating. Keeps me alive. Uh, and one more time, thank you guys. I very much appreciate what you guys are doing for us. It's awesome. Thank you, Mr. Grunwald. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ron Oliver. I also live in Meadowood. Uh, unfortunately, that teenager that just spoke, I'm 79, <laughs> <laughs> and I was in the service from 1963 to 1971, the United States Army. And all of us that live in Meadowood, we always pay our property taxes, we pay our state taxes, we pay all the things that everybody bills us for, and we pay our rent every month. And this whole planet, unfortunately, seems to be going in a kind of a interesting direction which you keep thinking it's going to go better because it's 2024 and yet we keep seeing things that aren't so we're really hoping that you'll all help because we always pay everything that we have to and now we're in a position you know like when you get you know I was just 21 the other day I had four kids nine grandchildren three great-grandchildren and you know, all of a sudden I'm 79. I thought, what the heck happened? You know, I was just 21 or just 16. I just got my driver's license. Anyway, so since we do all of our stuff, we're just hoping that you can help us. You know, now that we're at an age that uh, is kind of like, uh, I shouldn't say this, but on a little bit of a slippery slide downhill. So if there is any help, we really, really would ap appreciate it from all of you because uh, the way uh, things are running right now, especially even in Meadowood. Every year we get a raise here and there and there and there. And now, for this past since the pandemic, very little of anything has been done that we pay for around the park. So um, hopefully, if we get this change, we'll be able to make some uh, other changes in the people that take care of it and manage it and stuff like that, because we're paying for the upkeep, we're paying for this and paying for that, and now we're not getting anything. So we're looking towards you to help us and see if you can't, you know, save us uh, before. Of course, I'll spank myself if you don't. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Okay, but thank you very much. We appreciate everything that you're considering now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. <laughs> My name is Tamaris Blanchard, and next month I'll actually be old enough to live in the park, 55. <laughs> but I have been living there for 20 years now, and it is home for me. And people in the neighborhood are family, friends, and I actually have my mom living in the park, and my sister, and my stepdad. We've been there for quite some time, and we need your help. I am disabled, and so I'm not able to just go out and get a job. And uh, 
but I'm very proud to be an American because we do get Social Security to help us. But I ask that you help us also, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blanchard. Thank you. Good evening. I wasn't expecting to speak tonight. My name is Jan Wipert. I lived on the brewery property many years ago, and one of the joys of living down there was the foxes, the coyotes. We had deer in the back every morning in the summer. We had a, a bear. Somebody reminded me, and I never saw the bear when I was, or a bear down there. But we could see where it laid down. The grass was, you know, crushed down. We had a bobcat that came up on our back porch. We had cougars. We had um, turkey vultures. We had bald eagles. One morning, there was a bald eagle that came down the river in the fog. My husband and I were out there fishing. And that was huge to me because the next Christmas, he gave me a book of birds, and on the cover was a bald eagle. I opened the curtains that morning, Christmas morning, and there was an eagle in the tree outside. This is a special place. Our job, your job as council members, is to support people, not developers. Please understand, it's not your job to say, there's a developer that wants this project, let's do it. Let's see how many people we can squeeze in. Our job is to put support people. This is a little piece of heaven. And when they built the brewery, I don't know that there was much choice, but to me that was a horrible thing to see happen down there, better than some alternatives. But I hope you support this people. In my last minute and 15 seconds, I want to say I totally support election integrity. If we don't, what do we want in this country? We're losing free speech. We're losing our rights. We're losing what's dear to us. In 2020, I went to bed. In 2019, I went to bed. And I woke up the next morning, and I thought, those numbers can't be right. They aren't right. They aren't right. And I looked and looked and looked. They weren't right. What we hear on mainstream media is not what happened. There are courts that are finding these huge discrepancies. They're finding the fraud. They're finding the ballot harvesting. If you don't vote for election integrity, then I have to say, what are you here for? These vets over here fought for our country. They fought so we have a fair and free election, that we have our flag, and we are here I hope most of us to support this. Please support election integrity. This is what's at the base of this country. Stand for it, vote for it, keep us safe. Thank you. My name is Nyleen Billinger. I live in space number 30. I have lived in Meadowood Village for 48 years. August the 26th, I will be there 49 years. My parents moved in the park in 1971. The park was built in 1969 by Doug and Mrs. Buck. The residents in the park, we must keep it as it is affordable senior community. We all love the park, and there are really some really neat people that live in the park, and it is a nice park. We must have your help to, and all for all the residents that live in Meadow Lodge Village, and let's keep the Buck family tradition going, and thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zelta Medley, <clears throat> and my husband Steve and I have lived in Meadowood Park for nine years, and we love it. We love the place and love the people in it. And um, I'm not going to speak 
very long because I think everything has, just about everything has been expressed about how we as residents feel about Meadowood and we, we are just asking for your help. Uh, we're desperate for your support to help protect us from a predatory land grabber and from um, unaffordable rents that will definitely be coming if they are able to purchase it. Please find funding for our cause to purchase our park. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Medley. Thank you so much for letting me uh, speak with you guys. Uh, I am with Meadowood Village. I'm in lot 47. I am a displaced homemaker. And I was so grateful that there was- What's your name for the record? Oh, it's Laura White. It's Laura White. And this is my brother, David. David is disabled. He lives with me and I care for him. Uh, I uh, don't make a lot of money. I'm a caregiver and uh, I work very hard, but I was so grateful um, to be able to purchase this home at Meadowood Village because it empowered me to be able to live here in this beautiful city. I've lived in Colorado since I was, what, we were uh, 10 years old, I think, when we moved to, years. yep, 43 years. Uh, so anything that you can do to help support us to keep Meadowood Village alive, um, so that David and I can continue to live here in this beautiful city would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Mike Sell. I live in Meadowood, number 85. Um, I would want to thank you all, Mayor and the Council, for uh, taking our case up, and, and we appreciate any help you can give. I just wanted to, I've been sitting back there, can we get a show of hands of how many people are here from Meadowood? That's the support that we stick together and we're trying to save our own community. So we really do need your help. And uh, the reason why you have so many people here is because we're this close to not being able to stay there. Um, I know myself, when you, I just retired. Thank you, COVID, but anyway. <laughs> um, but when you go from a full income down to a minor income, and we've been there seven years, and in seven years we've seen seven increases, and if we get this next big increase, then half those trailers you see up there will be gone, and the trailer park will slowly, slowly disintegrate into pretty much, uh, they're gonna have to take the 55 off just to get people in there, because nobody else will be able to afford to stay there. So any help we can get would be much appreciated. Thank you for time. Thank you, Mr. Whitesell. <laughs> Is there anybody else that would wish to speak? Come on up. We're not done yet. <laughs> I'm waiting for Irma to come down with her jokes. <laughs> now she's hiding back there. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Teresa Dusky and I live in number 65 over at Meadowood. I'm actually a true native, born and raised in Pueblo, Colorado. My husband's job took us away and I've lived in four different states, but it ended up we came back to Colorado because this is home to us. We were fortunate enough to be able to find and buy a home in Meadowood 10 years ago. And for us, that was gonna be where we planned on being for the rest of our life. The last couple of years haven't been that kind to us health-wise, but we figured at least where we were in our mobile home, we can get around. I've got great neighbors. I'm close to other places that will help me fulfill the needs that I need, whether it be the doctors, the hospitals, transportation, it's all close and within reason. But if we have this big developer come in, I have no place to go. I have two daughters that live in Maryland, but they're not of the ability to be able to take me in. I can't afford any of the housing that they have here in Denver or anywhere in Colorado, so I don't have a plan B. My plan is A, to hopefully be able to get the money to help us to purchase our park and to make it the co-op that we can run and the place that we've all come to love and just don't wanna leave. So thank you so much. 
Thank you. I'm Mary DeAngelis, and I hate speaking in public. Can, can you say that into the mic so we can I'm, actually hear? I said I'm Mary DeAngelis, and I hate speaking in public. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to bring up. We have a lot of people in our community at Meadowwood that if this developer comes in and gets the, the mobile home park, they have nowhere to go. They can't afford to go anywhere else. They can't even take their trailers and go anywhere. There's nowhere to go. And then as I was thinking about this, I thought, I'm, I'm having some major problems with walking and stuff. And having a one level home is so important to some of us seniors. And these mobile homes are one level and we can, we can function in them better and feel like really worthwhile people. I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> is there anybody else that wish to speak? To uh, Irma, Irma, did I hear chants for Irma? Are we going to chant Irma? <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys got her up. All right, we'll have her up. I am Irma. Oh dear. Good evening, everybody. And I don't have a joke. I I sh I I know. Well, had I known, I'd I, I'd have brought a bunch of them. I like to um, send everybody off on Monday morning with a joke for the week, and um, sometimes they're pretty good ones. <laughs> Sometimes they're kind of bad, so. <laughs> but um, I am Irma Carnes, and of course from Meadowood also. Um, my husband Jim and I have lived there 11 years. We are both 91 years old, and thinking this is where we wanted to live the rest of our life when we moved there. We love it there. We have such great friends, special friends. Never in a million years, and I'll repeat that one, never in a million years would we have ever guessed what we are going through now. I, I just, Never would have believed this could have happened. Um, we're very upset, Jim and I. We're very worried about what is going to happen to us. At 91 years old, we just can't imagine this other company coming in and taking over our homes. Jim has cancer and is handicapped, which is another big worry of mine. So you can see your way of helping us and keeping all of our wonderful families together. We would be so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Irma. <laughs> All right. Anybody else wish to speak? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public comment portion of that and uh, turn it over to our council members. I'm going to start on this side. I'm going to give uh, Council Member Reichert first shot there. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to speak after Irma. It's not. Um, I feel like I'm not in a, I'm at a disadvantage here. Um, so I wanted just to report on a couple things that I've been doing since our last meeting. 
Um, I want to say thank you to uh, the new members of the Next Gen Committee. We had our first meeting, and, and I think that was very successful. I think we've got a lot of great work that we're going to be doing. Um, I want to say thank you to Andrea and Pam for allowing me to attend your public meeting and learn from you and get over my fear factor, and now I think I have enough intestinal fortitude to do one myself, so thank you very much. Um, I want to say thank you to Andrea and um, Jim and other city staff that uh, went with us to the um, uh, South Platte renewal tour. That was quite uh, interesting. I, I um, never thought I was going to learn about the texture of biosolid waste, but now I know about the texture of biosolid <laughs> waste. It's, uh, it's, it's a little, it's a little um, gooey. Um, <laughs> And the last thing I wanted to uh, say thank you to uh, the folks who put on the Project Downtown meeting at Bemis Library. I really appreciated the opportunity to learn about those plans. And I appreciate the members of the Next Gen Committee who attended that and provided me with feedback on and their perspectives. And so looking forward to talking about that in a couple weeks. Thank you. All right, thanks. Councilmember Grove. Uh, yes, uh, Council Member Peters and I had a citizen meeting on April 6. We were thrilled. We had about 80 citizens come and just talk about various issues. Some of the things that were brought up uh, were uh, Costco, uh, traffic on mineral, uh, density, infrastructure, the Crod Road, uh, Ridgeview, Jackass Hill, Geneva Village, energy, solar, stormwater, and safety. Those are just a few of the topics that we talked about. One thing that I really enjoyed is that people came early, got to know some of their um, fellow citizens, and stayed afterwards. I, the meeting was over at 11.15, and I didn't walk out until 12.30. So that was wonderful, and um, I will continue to host those um, throughout the year. Second thing I wanted to mention was I talked to uh, the Littleton Rotary Group last Wednesday and discussed our strategic plan. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, I won't go into detail, but the highest level, every year council meets in February to kind of look at our goals for the year and those goals turned into projects for staff. And some of the areas we're focusing on, I won't go into the specific projects, uh, we want to make sure we have a vibrant community with a rich culture, that our community has a healthy economy, that we're sustainable and good stewards of our natural resources. Our community is safe, which is very important to the people that live here, and that we have good governance. So those are the things we're going to hook our projects on, and we have about 33 projects that staff is going to be working on over the next few years in order to achieve those outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, a couple of quick announcements. Um, just also wanted to say how excited I am to see the new members of our Environmental Stewardship Board um, on, on board for uh, this n next term, and we're going to be hearing from them for their first report out um, in the coming study session. So stay tuned for that. Um, I had, uh, there was a, a Dr. Cog uh, board work session um, that took place earlier in the month, and a, the core of that work session was following up on the board's direction for a regional housing needs assessment to complement a lot of the legislation that is actually going uh, through our, um, our legislature right now. And uh, you can find the summary of that uh, the summary of those findings um, on the Dr. Cog website. Um, but just some of the kind of key highlights: uh, long-term targets for regional housing needs. We are going to be short by about 511,000 homes uh, by 2050, and our short-term target is around 216,000 homes, new units being built by 2033. Um, 137,000 or just slightly over 137,000 of those units will need to be for low income households, uh, those earning less than 60% of the area median income. Um, but the needs actually are dramatic and across the board uh, from all ranges of income, all types of housing. Um, this housing assessment is also kind of moving into its next stages, looking at potential mitigation measures, things that can be done at the local level. 
Um, we see things like uh, this, the assessors who are doing this study on behalf of Dr. Cog are looking at zoning, land use, and other regulatory barriers, infrastructure barriers as well, construction and finance, uh, things that we've kind of all heard in generality. I do want to say, though, um, that I'm really proud of our city and our public works department for doing things like proactively going out and inspecting sewer lines, not to have more poop commentary to follow on Council Member Reichardt's, but these are, you know, <laughs> but these are truly the, the things that make a city function, that, make, that allow us to be able to build our homes. So I'm excited to see our public works team going out there, scoping our stormwater assets, our sewer assets and piping throughout the city. Um, we are doing these things, I guess, sight unseen to be able to allow for the kind of growth and facilitate that growth that needs to happen throughout this region. Um, so anyway, if you were interested in that Dr. Cog study, it is posted on their web, on the board website. So um, that's it for my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember Peters. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to thank our police force. I got to do a ride along this week and it was awesome. I hear only good things about our police force and to be able to witness it firsthand was really special. Um, and then I was going to comment about Meadowood, but I think you've spoken for yourself. So I look forward to seeing what the city will bring us. Councilmember Ryden. Yes, thank you everybody for, for coming out here tonight. Um, I think what I, what I heard is a couple things and I want to make sure I get this right. I think I heard that many of you are on fixed incomes. Several of you are veterans. Several, several of you are working well past retirement age to help maintain your rents and the cost of inflation. Uh, many of you are struggling with mobility and you worry about being displaced somewhere that's gonna challenge that mobility. And just general feeling like your way of life and your community is at stake. Is that accurate? Just, yes. Okay. Um, so here's the direction that I have given our city attorney and our city manager. Um, which we gave last month and which I've had side conversations with as well and I want to be very transparent about what I have asked for and I think some of my council members uh, echo similar themes. One, I want options for various loans and how they could be funded and where that money comes from. Um, specifically, you know, what are the opportunity costs going to be with that $2.6 million or whatever that option might be. As you know, we have a set bu budget. Money doesn't come out of nowhere. So I want to be very clear is what, where could that come from and what would we be training as a city if we were to pursue that. Two, and Mike, our city, deputy city manager already mentioned this, I want us to explore zoning issues, which frankly I do not think is in conflict with some of our comprehensive plan um, because preserving our community is a goal. And clearly all of you have, special, have a special community that I think is worth fighting for. And that I think could be some change in zoning. Um, three, I want us to explore any mechanism the city of Littleton can take to help with rents. I think some of that has already been explored through the county, but we have not fully vetted that of what the city can do. Um, and I think there is some history um, in the past that I think we could live on. Um, and fourth, I've asked our city staff to really think creatively and not be afraid of any option that might be challenged in the courts. I think we should throw everything out there and see what we come up with. And I would love to have this by next week. I think that might be a tall order, but I think um, that is within well reach. I know we are in a tight time frame, right? June is the deadline, and so we need to make some decisions as soon as possible. Uh, okay. So that is my response to all of you. So thank you for that clarity. Um, uh, just a couple other updates for all of you and the rest of my council members. Um, Kelsey, who left, she mentioned this earlier, but there is a farmer's market that's going to be starting. It's going to be on Nevada. It'll be the first and third Sundays, May through October. They're going to have some bluegrass music, so it'll be a fun way to celebrate our community. Um, April 21st is Earth Day in downtown Littleton. Also, we'll have live music. There'll be a vegan food truck, crafts and activities, um, sustainable artisans market. It's 11 to 3, and that's going to be also on Nevada Street. Uh, next Friday, April 26th, is Final Fridays. That's downtown, so stores will be open late. So maybe enjoy happy hour um, at one of our awesome restaurants, and then kind of browse those boutiques. Uh, Spell Books, which is um, right down there. We'll be doing some poetry readings. They'll have the authors there to sign books. Um, and then April 21st and 28th and May 2nd will be the Downtown Littleton Mural Crawl. So that will be another way to immerse yourself in the culture of the murals that are throughout our downtown area. Um, and then lastly, on April 27th, which is a week from Saturday, I will be hosting um, a screening of the documentary film, The Abortion Talks, 
which is a powerful film about bridging political divides. It'll be from 2 to 4.15 p.m. It's gonna be at the Bemis Public Library. I'm co-facilitating that with Denver Post columnist Krista Kafer, um, and she and I ran against each other in our election in 2021. And so that we are models and examples of how you can have disagree on issues but still be able to talk about them. And so this documentary kind of highlights that and then we'll have a little bit of some discussion and some workshopping on how do we talk about difficult issues with our neighbors, with our coworkers, and with our friends and especially with our families. Uh, so check that out. You can RSVP directly to me, gwriting at littletongov.org. And that is all, Mayor. Thanks. Councilmember Driscoll. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank Ms. Chaborn for acknowledging Coach Murray and the DU Pioneers. Uh, my brother-in-law played for DU and Coach Murray uh, back in the day, so uh, uh, I'm a huge uh, fan and, and was thrilled to see them win their 10th national championship. Littleton Business Chambers on track. Uh, they had a, uh, a uh, happy hour last week. Uh, uh, they have an incredible website that you can uh, see all the different events, a lot that, uh, that Gretchen just mentioned, and also the Downtown Development Authority. Most of us just came from a little event they just had there. Uh, they also have a real good um, a website that uh, acknowledges the district, uh, the Downtown Development Authority district. So if anybody's interested in seeing what's going on uh, around, the, around the businesses in Littleton, that's all inclusive. And then the district, which uh, is primarily the downtown area from, say, from the, S the Essex uh, Hotel down to Arapaho, um, you can check out those websites. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, I've got several things here. First off, I just want to thank everyone that came down tonight. This is, I think, the fullest council chambers has been in a long time. Uh, thank you for all of you coming down and speaking, uh, having the bravery to come talk to us. I know we are a scary group up here, sitting up here on the dais looking down at you, but uh, it takes a lot to come down and speak, so I applaud you all for that. Um, and then um, just to the deputy city manager to uh, just, you know kind of reiterate some of uh, Councilmember Bryden's points of get in touch with them. I think this that 2.6 million dollar was the first time we've actually or I've ever heard of a number of that you're looking for. So I think we need to kind of ramp up some of this communication to figure out what what the the residents uh, need and what if anything that the city could uh, potentially um, take a look at and do um, to answer. Uh, Ms. Brichetto's question about uh, Costco, and maybe staff can fill me in if I'm incorrect here, but um, it is not uh, finalized. It is an administrative process. It'll go through city staff to make sure it complies with all the uh, zoning and codes. It's not gonna come to council uh, for approval or denial by this council, as it is a, a right uh, by a use of right by right um, for that area. So it's not done, but it'll go through staff and have make sure that they finalized everything that way. So that'll be that. Um, I uh, reiterate some of the other council members' comments about uh, uh, welcoming our new board and commission members who are taking their seats in April, who interviewed back in um, January or February and uh, interviewed and uh, were appointed uh, and are taking their seats now. So congratulations to all of them. Um, also, I want to congratulate DU Hockey for their championship. My alma mater, I saw Mayor Johnson was down there. I must have missed my invitation to come and welcome the team back. Um, um, uh, this weekend, I went to a performance of uh, Samba Colorado. It was at the East Community Center. It, uh, Samba Colorado was an organization that received a community grant uh, from uh, Littleton. And so I went to go see and check them out. And it was a great uh, event that they're teaching kids about um, African, Indigenous, uh, and Brazilian um, kind of music and dance. And uh, they have a new session starting up on May 19th. If anyone's interested, you can check out Samba Colorado. Uh, last week, I attended the LPS Foundation Spirit Celebration. Uh, there were some other city members, uh, city staff members there, and I saw a handful of uh, Centennial City Council members there as well. Um, and then I'd just also like to welcome a new restaurant that's in Littleton. The 49th is over just north of Prince here. They just opened yesterday. Haven't had a chance to eat there, but it uh, looks uh, delicious. And then remind council on the community that uh, this Thursday at 4 p.m. is the East Community Center ribbon cutting uh, over at the East uh, Community Center. And then Friday uh, is the Littleton Leadership Academy. The council has kind of a, a meet, meet the council members with that organization. And so that is all I have. So I'm going to turn it over to the deputy city manager if he has any further report or update. Just to emphasize that we, we hear your guidance clearly, and we will we'll continue to work hard on this in a timely manner. And look forward to talking with you about it more next week. Thanks. And city attorney. 
Uh, yeah, just to piggyback on your comment regarding the Costco. So yes, that is an application um, that has come in that staff is still working with, as well as Costco. It's really just in an application phase. But however, that type of use is an allowed use for that portion of the Lumen site. Um, it, the next phase in that, assuming it goes through, would just be a site plan, which is an administrative function. So during the site plan phase, we would look at things such as traffic safety, all those various things from an administrative level. Um, what is going on on that property will be happening on Monday, which is a detailed master development plan for Embry. If for those folks that remember back in, I want to say December, we rezoned that property, the Lumen site, so that um, a portion of it could be used for a multifamily, and that is Embry. Embry will, will be coming on Monday in front of Planning Commission to really show how their layout uh, fits in with that specific site. So uh, the public is welcome uh, to show up on Monday for Planning Commission and provide any comments they want regarding um, the approval or denial or conditioning of that master development plan. That's all I have for you tonight. Thank you. So what you said is, I was correct. You were just using some fancy words to make yeah, it sound uh, more legal. All right. I, was, <laughs> I should have had Irma right. speak for me. All right. That's <laughs> yes, but <laughs> all right. Uh, that's all we have for comments and reports. And next up on our agenda, our scheduled appearances. We have one tonight. Uh, we have Arapahoe County Health Department. I have, let's see, I've got Jennifer Ludwig and Heather Baumgartner. Or, great. So, come on down. Good evening and thank you. Now help me pull up our. I love the opportunity to talk about public health in such a large audience. So. Uh, appreciate this being the largest uh, evening of public comment. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, great. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Jennifer Ludwig. I'm the public health director for Arapahoe County. And I appreciate time on the agenda for me and my colleagues, Heather Baumgardner and Alexa Escobar Payez. Uh, Heather will introduce herself. herself. Alexa is our senior population health epidemiologist. And at the beginning of the meeting, we handed out our community health assessment. And that was a, a great collaboration among the health department, um, but Alexa was really the lead in the data of that. So uh, if there's anything else that we can dig into, we're, we are happy to do that. Um, tonight, really just want to share with you, um, there it goes an update of Arapahoe County Public Health, and then the top countywide health issues as a result of our community health assessment, which is something that we are statutorily required to do every five years as a new health department. This is our first community health assessment for Arapahoe County, and we're pleased to present that to you tonight. After we present a little bit about um, what we are up to and those top health issues. We would love if there's opportunity to get reflections from you all. What we've heard tonight, I think really resonated with a lot of the work that public health cares about and the work that we do. Uh, and it sounds, you know, and from hearing from you that you are also very engaged in these. So before I dig in, I really just want to thank you for being champions of public health. We consider municipal partners and leaders like yourselves to be among the most important partners to really create conditions that help support health and well-being. So your work and outcomes over the past few years has really supported um, key health-related efforts in areas like safety, natural resources, civic involvement, and outdoor spaces. So we know that the gains in these areas are all really um, important protections that allow our residents to thrive. So just a little bit about Arapahoe County Public Health. Um, many of you are probably aware that we were formed out of the dissolution of Tri-County Health Department at the end of 2022. We opened up in January of 2023, and I'm really proud to say that we hit the ground running. We were offering services on day two 
even though we couldn't figure out how to turn on our computers or <laughs> couldn't figure out our phone system for about two weeks, but we were there serving the public. And we had tremendous support from all of our municipalities. And we have uh, four locations, we're under five divisions, and we currently have 198 employees. Our four locations throughout the county, we have one in Inglewood, one in Aurora um, at Caf Colfax and Chambers, another at South Aurora at Hamden and Chambers, and then one in Greenwood Village. And that is, we will be moving out of that location in the summer of 2025 when our lease is up. But we have a wide range of services based out of all different uh, locations ranging from immunizations to syringe exchange, our harm reduction program to environmental health, and also um, birth and death certificates. So each location is different, um, but our, our services are vast and deep, and lots more information can be found on our website, um, and then also through that community health assessment. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Heather Baumgartner, who is the Director of Partnerships, Planning, and Community Health Promotion, and leading the effort of our community health improvement planning process. Thanks so much for your time uh, tonight, members of council and um, members of the community for sharing your stories. As Jennifer mentioned, um, these are all um, elements we know that are strong influencers of health and the vibrancy of the community. Um, so we appreciate your time and comments. Uh, as your local health department, it is very important for us to understand how we can be the best possible partner in supporting and advancing health and wellness within the city of Littleton. Uh, we recently, as Jennifer mentioned, completed a comprehensive community health assessment. That is something uh, mandated in Colorado statute. Every local health department does it, as does the state health department. And the idea is really to take a look at your health burden data, quantitative data, qualitative data, get a full look across the gamut of health influencing factors uh, to, to take the pulse of the county, see where we're at, and how we might prioritize efforts to make the biggest impact moving forward for the, the five years to follow that. So what you see up on the screen is a timeline of the process that we've taken. It's a structure that the process itself is mandated in statute as well. It's best practice, um, considered best practice in public health for how we might go about understanding needs and opportunities. So in January, we began um, engaging with community, doing listening sessions, surveys, looking at the data, um, and the product of that, I believe you have or will have, um, and they're also perfect, yes. Also, you can uh, get that on our website. But we take all that information, um, including what we're hearing from the community, and start narrowing down. Obviously, everything can't be a priority moving forward. You know that very well from, from the efforts that you lead. And we ended up with six top priorities so far. So we want to share these with you um, and get your reactions and start the dialogue exploring where we might be able to find um, opportunities, synergy to work together and support your efforts in a meaningful way. So the, the key issues that emerged out of the health assessment um, won't surprise you, and we've heard about a lot of them this evening. Um, these are not in a particular order. Safety, and for this Part of the process, we are not putting strong guardrails on what that might include. Once we've narrowed it down to maybe a top two or three that we can really work together across the public health sector to make big gains on, at that point, we will narrow down what exactly do those strategies look like um, through further conversations. So safety uh, may include, but, but also um, may include other aspects, but things that we investigated um, included gun violence, suicide rates, homicide, older adult falls, neighborhood safety, interpersonal violence, and motor vehicle safety <clears throat> as a few examples, housing issues as you would imagine, access, affordability, safety, um, and considerations related to houselessness. Um, similar to housing, food-related issues emerged and touched on issues like cost, accessibility, and availability, as well as quality, so nutritional content and sustainability. 
Environmental issues that emerged uh, included elements like air quality, water quality, green spaces, <clears throat> and factors related to cl climate change. Economic security concerns related to income, overall financial well-being, navigating assistance programs, and the impact of financial strains on mental health as well. Uh, finally, access to care. So access to physical and behavioral care concerns um, included but weren't limited to availability to find providers <clears throat> and pay for care, insurance coverage, care for people without documentation, care navigation, and more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our next step in this process is to get a better understanding of capacity. So where across our communities uh, are we seeing a lot of momentum, a lot of need, and maybe availability for resources that can be brought to bear to address these issues. And so we're bringing this for it before you tonight to share the results, <clears throat> but also to um, start some dialogue. Uh, and I know you have a, it's been a long night, you've had a busy agenda, uh, so we might not be able to engage in a full dialogue, but we, we'd love to know. You know, you mentioned <clears throat> current and future priorities. You're interested in, um, vibrant community, rich culture, sustainability, safety, good governance, healthy economy, um, <clears throat> and your work pulling together um, an updated strategic plan. So we'd love to hear, like I said, whether it's this evening or in future conversations, from the list that we provided, where you see the best potential alignment with your priorities and what we've heard countywide as well. Um, is there anything on the list that surprised you? Um, are there any areas where you feel like the city of Littleton might have stronger capacity and interest? Um, and do any of the issues, do you feel offer the greatest opportunity to engage constituents? So we're happy to answer any questions if you have them. Um, and we're also happy to follow up later to see what some good next steps might be. Council, anyone have any questions? Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, thank you for the report, and I'll take some time reading through it and kind of taking a look at your, you know, survey data and, and the like. I would say, you know, maybe my top question for you in the 2024 or 25 year are, you know, what is your next game plan? Like, is it obviously diving deeper, obviously, into some of these key issues, but were there any that your team was particularly going to focus on? Some of these things obviously overlap with many of the municipalities in the jurisdiction, but some of them are obviously don't. And so just curious as to what your game plan for the coming year is. Absolutely. So one of our, our big initiatives for this year is completing the community health improvement plan, which is the next step of after the community health assessment. So that is a big effort underway. And still as a new health department, we are still getting our feet under us and um, completing operations, policies, procedures. But we have um, our board of health. So we are gumber, gumber, eh, governed by a board of health appointed by the county commissioners. Our board adopted a strategic plan last year that is uh, based around a, a health equity framework, um, and it is a CDC framework. So our big focus is really looking at root cause, social determinants of health, and health equity, and looking at our resources and our programs of what we are doing to ensure that we are looking at those social determinants and root causes. Um, so we're, we're still building out our program base, um, but a few areas in which we have uh, fortunately received some extra grant funding is on our harm reduction program through the uh, Colorado Opioid Abatement Council as well as Region 9 Ab Abate over uh, Opioid Abatement Council. Um, to, we just launched a RV mobile unit called Prevention Point. And so with that we are able to meet people where they are at and we offer STI testing, HIV testing, and syringe ac access. Um, so some areas in which we know we needed to focus, we're also focusing in different parts of the county that uh, we have historically not been very engaged in, heavily focused on healthy aging as well. So there's some areas that even as a new health department, we've already expanded, uh, and also areas in which we, we just need to get um, the basics under us. So those have been our big initiatives, is just 
getting going. And then this community health improvement plan will really help guide us over the next five years of how we work with our community on things that really matter. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for doing this. I will look over and read it and be in contact with any questions. We really do appreciate this. This is such an important uh, function that the public health department does for, for Littleton, and I think sometimes we forget that. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Record. Um, I thank you for coming. We met at the mobile health unit uh, snowstorm, and uh, <laughs> it was uh, the snow squall. It, we, it, you are, everyone showed more fortitude than I expected during that great weather event. Um, I guess a couple of things. So I'm, I would be very interested in engaging a little bit more with you around your your priority around uh, health equity and safety. The District Two in Littleton is one of our more diver is our most diverse district in Littleton, and we've had two shootings in the last year uh, in that area and I would like, I, I need help thinking about how to address those problems and so any, any assistance I could get in helping to think about my role in, in supporting that part of my community, I would really, really appreciate that um, guidance and, and support. And then um, I'm confident you're aware of this. I, in my past life I was on the school board and, and you're, um, you know, the Littleton Public Schools was a suicide cluster and has successfully, um, well, I don't. I don't think. I don't think anyone can take credit for pulling out of a school. But it's not that right now. But the mental health and suicide, I know, is still a priority within that institution. And I hope you guys are working together. So, um, but thank you very much. And I want to echo what uh, Council Member Ryden said. We, we appreciate your work, and, and we're glad you're here, and glad you chose to come here during the dissolution of Tri County. So, thank you. Thank you, and we'll follow up with you regarding the health equity and safety. Great, thank you. And I have, well, I guess. Some kind of a question, more of a comment, but I just want to say thank you for coming down uh, and sharing information with us, getting on to the community. I think uh, living in a, a world, we seem to live in a world of misinformation and disinformation, I think, especially in the realm of public safety, but all sorts of things um, um, generally. And so it's good to kind of get out there and say what you're doing, what you're, you're talking to the community, having that communication. And then to uh, piggyback off of Councilman Reichert, is my, the only question I would have is, you know, what's your engagement with the school district and, um, you know, educating um, the, the educators, but also the, the children in there. I think that would be a, a, a good step and a good place for the health department to kind of um, make good Absolutely. inroads. Well, we've been talking about also maybe doing this something similar with boards of education. Uh, but our engagement right now, we do a lot of in the schools with harm reduction, um, talking about suicide, or excuse me, um, overdose prevention, Narcan training, where schools will let us. Um, and we also go into high schools and talk about sexual health and family planning to let teens know that we are available, um, confidential services. And we have our school we have a, a nurse who works with the school nurses to increase immunization rates. So we are going into schools that have the lowest vaccination rates to work with um, with those schools specifically to be able to vaccinate school children while they're in school. And so we've been reaching out and building up partnerships with schools, individual schools and school districts, but we have not yet scheduled, but are considering doing a little bit of a roadshow with boards of education as well, just to make sure that they know that we're here, what we do, what we can offer, and to hear from them. One of the most recent things, um, partnerships is also working with them um, related to vaping prevention, <clears throat> um, tobacco use and vaping prevention. That is a grant that we receive fairly consistently through the state health department. And so we've been able to partner with um, little to public school staff to helpfully get, get, support them, but help also even be there with them in the classrooms um, and, and support some of the education that they're doing. Y you might be also familiar with the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, which is a survey that can happen at the school level, really providing important data that educators and the community can work together to use and make improvements. Um, and so that's outreach we do as well. We're happy to help in any way um, with uh, educating about that as a resource, even helping proctor it uh, and analyze and communicate the data are also things that we are excited to partner on. Great, thank you so much. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your time. All right. Um, just want to check in with council. Does anyone need a 
break, and I was just checking. We might have a good time to have a recess. If anyone didn't want to stick around for the rest of the meeting, could uh, take a take five minute recess and uh, reconvene at eight fifteen. If yeah, well, some they might if they want to. So you are welcome to stay.
soon as we get our clerk slash attorney. <clears throat> and I get my computer on. Bless you. All right, we'll go ahead and get started here without them. All right, next up, uh, item seven, uh, proclamations. Uh, we've got uh, three of them. I'm only going to read one because uh, uh, we have uh, those folks in the room here, but one, I'm going to read the other two names without reading the full proclamation. Uh, I have a proclamation of the city of Littleton, Colorado, recognizing the Littleton team of the All Veterans Honor Guard in the city of Littleton. I will present this to the All Veterans Honor Guard at one of their meetings. And then we have a proclamation of the city of Littleton, Colorado, proclaiming April 26, 2024, Arbor Day in the city of Littleton. And this is a proclamation we have for our Tree City USA um, certification that we do. But on to the main show of proclamations here. Uh, we have a proclamation of the city of Littleton, Colorado, proclaiming April 14th, April 20th, 2024, National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in the city of Littleton. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services, when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers, firefighters, and paramedics is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. And whereas thousands of dedicated telecommunications professionals serve the community of this country every day by answering phone calls for police, fire, and emergency medical services, dispatching appropriate assistance quickly and efficiently. And whereas the 911 Communications Center for the City of Littleton performs a critical function and are a key link in the public safety chain which protects all of us and are constantly striving to improve their emergency response capabilities through leadership, dedication, and technology processing on an average of over 100,000 phone calls a year. And whereas the, city of our, the safety of our police officers in Littleton are dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who call the city of Littleton 911 Communications Center, and whereas Littleton's 911 communications staff are the single vital link for our police officers by monitoring their activities by radio, providing them information, and ensuring their safety, each one exhibits compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job every day of the year. And whereas Colorado is, in the 18th, is the 18th state to pass legislation via HB 24 1016 earlier this year to classify emergency communication specialists as first responders, and whereas by United States Congressional Proclamation, the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials International, a worldwide telecommunications organization composed of more than 35,000 people, engaged in the operation, installation, and design of emergency response communication systems, has set aside the second week of April to recognize the contributions made by telecommunicators and their critical role in the protection for everyone's life and property. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Kyle Schlachter, Mayor of the City of Littleton, do hereby proclaim the week of April 14th through 20th, 2024, as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in the City of Littleton, to honor the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city and citizens safe, and to commend the Littleton 911 Communications Center for their dedication in providing service 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I'd just like to... Thank all the uh, staff for sitting there for that. And I believe, I believe we have the esteemed Chief Stevens that would like to say uh, a few, a very few words. He's got about 45 minutes, right? Yes, good evening, Council Mayor. I'm Doug Stevens, Chief of Police. Uh, it's interesting we had all the folks from Meadowbrook here. I think my bedtime's earlier than theirs, uh, but they all split to go to sleep. But, here we are. We gotta hurry this along because all the 911 calls coming in now are going to voicemail because all the dispatchers are here, so. That was a joke for anyone yeah. watching? <laughs> I just wanna recognize and thank uh, our outstanding professional staff that works in Dispatch Center. 
Um, without the work that you do, we couldn't do the work that we do. Um, so many times, uh, you guys are without a doubt the voice of calm. Um, when someone calls in during oftentimes their most traumatic experiences, uh, you know, hypothetically, maybe their son falls out of a tree in the park. I mean, you know, some stuff like that happens. Uh, but uh, you guys, you handle everything coming in. You keep us safe out there on the streets, and, and we truly appreciate your professionalism and your dedication. Uh, you often go unrecognized, and you you work in some interesting conditions at times, And uh, but we're all very, very proud of you. I'm proud to be the chief in a department that has such outstanding staff, and uh, we perform at a high level because uh, you perform at a high level. So thank you so much. Appreciate everything you do. Thanks, Council. <laughs> And I'll just echo what the chief said. You all are so great, really. I truly appreciate you and all you do for our community. <laughs> <laughs> and you thought they were here for that proclamation. <laughs> and now you're leaving. They're not staying here. All right. Item eight is the consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda items can be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read by title prior to a vote on the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of a council member. A. Resolution 40 of 2024, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with South Suburban Parks and Recreation District and the City of Centennial for creation of a trail in South Platte Park. B, Resolution 56 of 2024, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Board of County Commissioners of the County of Arapaho, State of Colorado, regarding a financial contribution for constructing a mineral station west multimodal project. C, Resolution 46, 2024, uh, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Board of County Commissioners of Douglas County regarding the cost sharing for the County Line Road, Broadway to University project. D, Resolution 53, uh, 2024, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Mile High Flood District for major drainage way planning for Range View Gulch. E, ID 24110, Motion to approve the minutes of the April 2nd, 2024, regular meeting of City Council. Mayor, move to approve the consent agenda. Items A through E. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Uh, council, any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, I'll open the voting. Digging the new, uh, new graphics we got here. We're floating heads above the dais. It's I know it was last week, but <clears throat> what'd you say, Robert? I said it's <laughs> the vote is seven in favor. The motion carries. Thank you, clerk slash attorney. All right, item nine on the agenda is general business. We have one item under general business tonight. Uh, resolution 55 of 2024. Uh, resolution consenting to the exclusion of property from the boundaries of Santa Fe Park Metropolitan District Number Three. So we'll have a presentation uh, from staff. A city attorney can fill us in on this a little bit more, uh, and council can ask any questions we have. And so, city attorney. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, the applicant in this case is the Metro Districts who sought to uh, exclude. A portion of a previously identified location from 
their district. Um, I have with us tonight is Megan Murphy. She is the attorney representing the Santa Fe Park Metro District's numbers one through four, and she'll be giving a brief kind of overview and presentation of the ask for counsel tonight, and then I will jump in um, as needed. So uh, I'll turn it over to Megan. Up here? Either way, wherever you want. It should be on the stem of the microphone up higher, I believe is the button. I don't know what, what you guys have. Now it's on? Yes. Okay, great. Good evening, Council, Mayor, Megan Murphy, White Bear Inkley, Tanaka and Waldron, Legal Counsel, the Santa Fe Park Metropolitan Districts 1 through 3. I'm here tonight on behalf of just District 3, although they all are working together. I have a brief presentation for your review. As a reminder, I saw you in 2021, or some of you in 2021, to approve the service plan. Part of the service plan says we can't change the boundaries without the prior written con Oh, sorry, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, okay, my apologies. Um, it says we need the city council's consent to exclude property from the boundaries once we've issued debt. Districts one and three have issued debt, but only three is seeking an exclusion. They've entered into this establishment agreement. We've issued bonds at the end of 23. Now I'm coming to you saying, can we please exclude some property from District 3? Here's the reason why we're asking for this. In 2021, there was a plan for development where District 4 would overlay on top of Districts 1 and 2. I'll go to a map in a second. And it was going to act as an O&M district. Since that time, a portion of the property in District 3 has been sold to a third-party developer, no longer owned by Toll Brothers, America's luxury home builder, and now they need District 4 to be the apartment multifamily operator. So this is what it looked like in 2021, the last time you saw us. Um, I'm talking about the green parcel that runs right along Santa Fe, and the District 4 is the hatch that goes above the yellow and the blue. This is what it was. This is what we'd like it to be. So you can see the green is split, where the red is no longer hatched over the blue and yellow. It's now its own district, and it'll have a multifamily parcel. The little exclusion area that's gray, right along Santa Fe, you see is green here and is now gray, is owned by the city of Inglewood. So we no longer need to include it in our boundaries or tax it because it's tax exempt. So if you can go back to the previous slide. Yep. So when we're talking about the issuance of bonds, what we're referring to is the blue section and the green section. Those are the ones who already issued bonds. And then going forward to this new one, what would be happening is that exclusion of property. And so the red on that location would be what would be the multifamily. The green in that green corner is the portion of the property that was sold to Evergreen. Um, so that is no longer owned by toll. And going forward, some of the thoughts behind it would be to separate the operations and maintenance of those two respective locations. So the commercial um, being assigned its own O&M that they can issue, as well as the multifamily having its own. Um, regardless of what council decides, in terms of the debt service that's already been issued, they're all still going to be responsible, other than the yellow. Um, of repaying that previously issued debt. So that is not going to change. It's not going to fall onto, um, no one's getting out of the repayment of that. So I'm and sorry. The, and the yellow has no issued debt right now. Is that correct? Pardon? The yellow area was no, has no issued debt right now? That, was, that's correct. Okay. That's District 2, which is future residential. You'll be seeing that application, I'm sure, at a future time, but it hasn't been platted. So we're not changing any financial terms. No one's owing more, owing less, changing mill levies, changing fees. None of that is happening. What we're trying to do is say now we've identified two distinct users and they have two distinct operations and maintenance needs. Can they have two different destinies? So the apartments are gonna have different needs than a commercial user for operations and maintenance. Can they be split for that purpose? So they're not split for debt, just for operations and maintenance. Right. You know, it was as was as Miss Murphy initially noted, there is a requirement once there is the issuance of debt to get city council consent. So that's why it is in front of you tonight. I'm happy to answer additional questions. 
I'm com is the O&M a debt or is it an ongoing operation? It's not a debt service mill levy. It's not a financial obligation. It's an ongoing operations and maintenance mill levy. Will debt be issued to pay for the O&M? No, that's not possible under Tabor. It's an annual appropriation mill levy. Okay. So the, just to clarify, this does not put a higher burden of tax or debt or anything on that commercial, the green piece? Correct. Nobody's getting more or less financial burden or benefit. Everybody's still under the same service plan, the same mill levy cap, the same debt cap. So if the commercial chooses to levy a higher mill up to the cap in the service plan to fund their O&M, it doesn't impact the multifamily and vice versa. They can make their own choices for the O&M services they need and impose the taxes on their users. So why are you coming to us instead of Evergreen, since they now own it? Oh, because I'm the Metro District lawyer. So when we talk about the land owner, I don't represent them. This is a requirement in the service plan for the Metro District, oh, and my board has asked me to come to you. You just represent the Metro District, not the developer. Okay, yes, thank council you. member. Yep, yeah, any more questions? Yeah. Sorry, I had a couple, and I think you may have seen these questions. So how much debt has been issued so far? Yeah. I'm going to call it $8 million and change because I'm not the accountant. But if you'd like me to do a quick calculation, I can get you an exact number if that's critical. Eight, close to eight and a half? Close to eight and... Close to eight and a half. Okay. And then uh, you, you said that how is the debt allocated to the different... Payers, is it based on um, how, how is it? So, we're about to um, go to a place called Metro District Land. So, just suspend your belief in any type of financing and come along with me because it's a very different structure than what we're used to. So, districts one and three have only made a promise to impose a mill levy and repay what that mill levy brings in to bondholders. So there's not a promise to pay $5, $10, a million dollars. The promise is to impose this mill levy. So District 1 has said we'll impose 40 mills, 30 for debt for our project and 10 for regional debt. District 3, as this figuration, has promised to impose 10 mills. That's there's, the green. That's the green. There's no additional allocation or promise beyond that. So it's very unlike where you and I take out debt and we have these payments, all they're required to do is impose a mill levy. The bondholders take the risk so that it wouldn't be enough to repay. So it's not as if the $8 million is split in some sense. It's just two different mill levy promises. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, so can you repeat back that you said the, the green is, or we're looking at the, the, yep, the original is, district? Yep. When the debt was issued, the green parcel said we'll pay 10 mills. That's District 3, the yep. old District 3? And that's static. It's going to stay, stay the same. That can't change. Cannot change. And pursuant to state statute, there's nothing anyone could do to change it. So even if you were to approve the exclusion tonight, you can't change the 10 mills. Once the debt is issued on that property, it's on that property till it's repaid. And then the, res the District 1 is issued... Four, said, 40 mills. 40 mills. 30. Is that because the residential is going to ultimately have less assessed valuation and then it needs to raise more to pay um, its share of the debt? District 1 received more cash in the transaction because it's paying for improvements that serve just District 1. So it's 40 mills is combined of 30 mills, that's just District 1 improvements, and 10 mills of regional improvements, which matches the District 3 pledge. So a long time ago when we did the service plan in 2021, we said here's a bucket of improvements that are regional, here's a bucket that's district specific for each of the three districts. Do you remember that? I, that was before my time. Oh, okay. Uh, but, but sure. Yes, yeah, we, we're did, in, we did that, yeah. We're in district, metro district land anyway, yes, so sure, I, I remember know. that. It's hard. Sure. <laughs> stay, stay with me. I know it's unique. It's different. Um, so what the 10 mills is from each district is funding Dad Clark, Clark Gulch, that beautiful barn that we're keeping and preserving, and then the District 1 30 mills pays for things inside the boundaries of District 1 that don't impact the District 3 property owners. 
So, so I totally um, understand the need for metro districts. I mean, that's how we pay for infrastructure for new development. And so I'm, I'm but I think, um, you know, as a city, we have a metro district uh, on the uh, east end of town that's run into some financial challenges. And so, um, and those financial challenges have kind of had two consequences for us. One is that we've had to do repairs um, on the roads when they were unable to do that. And two, um, part of the reason we are giving incentives for that area are because um, it's been hard to do the commercial development that's there. It's only part of the reason, and, and I think incentives are, are fine um, and part of our, our, our future. So, so there's just a, I'm just trying to make sure that people aren't unfairly kind of burdened or it creates future problems. So the other question is, you know, when you came to, came to this group without me, but I'm in Metro District land, so I remember it, um, you had, you put, there was a plan put forth for repayment of the debt as well, and that was based on kind of uh, a pace of construction and, and increases in, mil, in assessed valuation. Where are we, how, are, how close are you to following the, that pace of improvement? I mean, or, does that make sense? It does, Okay, yeah. good, because that, that was the best I could say. Yeah, we're a little behind schedule on construction. I don't think that's any secret for any of you that have dri driven down Santa Fe. Uh, dirt's moving, but there's not a rooftop there, right? So that's not what we talked about in 2021. Um, but that's okay, because in Metro District land, that's not an event of default. So, so long as we're imposing the property taxes and remitting them to the lender, that's sufficient. There is no requirement to have such and such rooftops by date, such and such AV by a date, such and such road built by a date. It's a very magical place. So, so currently, the, your clients, which are the owners of the land who make up the Metro board, are paying the mill levies to repay the debt, but, it's, but there's not, there hasn't been the expected increase in the value of the land that was part of the original plan. But that is not a problem because you only promised to pay the mill levies in Metro District land. I'm repeating back what I heard. That was 99% accurate, and I don't mean to be nitpicky, but Please my, do. my client ahead. is when the Metro District, not the land developer. So I want to be really clear that I don't represent Toll Brothers here tonight. I'm here on behalf of the district. But my understanding, and, and I, I look forward to being corrected, is that the Metro District is made up of the landowners. Is that accurate, or am I wrong? The Board of Directors would be yeah. chosen. The, the Board of Directors are qualified pursuant to state statute, and, and many are, in fact, employees of Toll Brothers. And again, I don't mean to be nitpicky. It's just a nuance in the law. So that's I'm not trying to be that lawyer. Yes. Yeah, no, that's fine. She gets, that's what, thank you. you I'm not you trying did, to be that lawyer. You, you, you're doing great. We, we, um, we can let the city attorney be that lawyer. So, you, no, no, you, you, you said good things. We, we met for an hour. They put up with an hour of my, of my questions, and they said good things about you. The last thing is the, and this is maybe for you, and it may be for Mike. So, um, it, it sounds like the planned use of this land has changed in Metro District 4. Is that true, and will that require a rezone? New Metro District 4? New Metro District the 4. New met, the old Metro District 4 was all housing. The new Metro mm -hmm. District 4 is the red square. Correct. Is that going to require a, And maybe you haven't done your plan, so we don't know if it requires, but... There's plenty of good answers there. I'm just no, trying I, to figure out what's going on. You know, having been a part of kind of the development conversation with the Toll Brothers parcel and those future uses for for them, it has, uh, Toll has always been pretty consistent. They're a residential developer. They don't do commercial. It's always been relatively consistent. When you looked at this um, plat as a whole, and when, when I'm saying as a whole, Looking on the north, this is all part of the Santa Fe Park um, plat that was done back in the 80s that was annexed into the city. Um, it had a variety of uses, and it was, it was kind of wonky because it was a planned development when it came in, so it was a PD. It was originally envisioned to be kind of like, a, we'll call it Denver Tech Center. So it was originally contemplated during one of the earlier iterations in the 80s to have uh, a lot of those commercial uses towards the river, towards South Platte, uh, towards the South Platte and South Platte Park and the residential on the east side. 
Um, primarily, Evergreen has been the one that has struggled with that. When the city has gone through and, and rezoned a lot of these portions, it has opened up some options. But Toll Brothers, for purposes of this location, has always been pretty consistent with the residential, um, as well as wanting to make use of residential all throughout this development. Um, there were certain parts of the PD that were zoned as commercial, as I, as I just spoke to, and so that was kind of a, a change. Um, well, that's always been consistent. I think the city attorney means to say no, I'm gonna maybe, talking, but probably not. I'm going to keep talking until you, you either nod your head in affirmation or nod off, so either. <laughs> um, but, but I would say that I wouldn't say that some of the uses have changed. I just think it has been more defined. I, I'm not sure it'll be a rezone. I, I don't know specifically. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's so. There's not going to be a rezone. No. That was the question. Is there going to be a rezone? No. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> That's not as fun. We went back to 1980 Metro District land, so there <laughs> so, was a tornado that came up and dropped you off. Uh, yeah, so ultimately, uh, I was in high school. Um, the green, though, is going to, in this current map that we're showing, the green is probably going to be more commercial, and the red is going to be more residential. Multi-family red, commercial green, yes. No rezone. No rezone. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. I appreciate you putting up with my questions, and I appreciate the journey. So, I, I mean, I think the gist is we're separating a, 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 that original green block that was District 3 was kind of an unknown use of what was going to be there, and we're trying to separate into commercial and a multifamily district to separate them so that the commercial or would not be reliant on, or the residential would not be reliant on commercial mill levies so they have their own operating costs. That's the whole point of doing this. There, um, division there. There were certainly a lot of conversations from from both from toll to see if there could be a transfer of use to make the green uh, section currently there as residential. Those conversations have happened over five years. The answer was no. Any other oh, yeah, Councilmember Grove? Question. I realize this is outside of what you're asking us, but you said they're making payments right now. They've got no rooftops, nothing coming in. And that's just because they have deep pockets, or are they going to try to make this up later on? So the districts are required to impose the mill levy, and then whatever revenue that brings in, they remit to the bondholders on the debt service side. So we've imposed a mill levy for 2023, which is collected in 2024. As you know, property taxes are imposed in arrears. So we've received property tax revenue from the property owner, and we're remitting it to the bondholders. So Did until there's actually construction that's occurring on there when the county goes in and does a valuation of the site it's currently you know, vacant property it's not being valued very highly so once low. you start okay. putting rooftops on there and the county assessor gets involved valuation obviously is going to go up for the property property taxes will go up and those will be remitted to and by that time you have homeowners or renters whatever okay thank you that's my record the last stupid question so i doubt that no <laughs> oh, for tonight you meant for tonight <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I stepped into that land. That <laughs> Just was, kidding. Touche. Good. Well played, Mr. Mayor. Um, when you said the obligation is to impose the mill levy, when does that obligation end? In 2053. So the bondholders get whatever that mill levy yields for the next 30 years. Is that accurate? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. That's now why it's magical. That's, but it also means um, they've taken a risk, but their their possible payout is is pretty high if the if the um, the valuation increases as much as they hope. <laughs> right. So it's a capped mill levy, so it's not as if values go up and homeowners will pay more than the mill levy allows. Right. The risk is only negative for the bondholders. So if values don't go up, the bondholders won't be repaid. How is, how is the mill levy capped? Is it capped on the amount it can raise or on the number of mills that are being uh, paid off? In your infinite wisdom, you capped both in the service plan. It was, yeah, it's in the service plan we did in 21. It was capped at, uh, was it 40 or was it, yeah, 40 mills? 52 you know, mills 50. all in with the regional and the single district and you also capped the debt at 40 million that could be issued. So both are capped both the number of mills we can impose and the dollar amount of debt we can issue. But I'm thinking about how much can they get repaid? 
Oh, just as much as was issued in this transaction. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Okay, anyone wish to propose a motion? Mayor, I move to approve resolution 55 2024, resolu uh, consenting to the exclusion of property from the boundaries of Santa Fe Park Metropolitan District number three. Second. Have a motion and a second to approve resolution 55. Council, any further discussion or comments? Mayor Pro Tem? Smart plan separating O&M expenses for two different types of land uses, so thank you for doing so. Thank you, and as always, thank you to your wonderful city attorney. He's very helpful. Aww. Any other? We're still in magical comments? land. Comments? So <laughs> <okay. laughs> Um, yeah, I will just say I, I appreciate the thoughtfulness with looking at this as, you know, changing how the, the, the boundaries of the district to fit the uses, which may cause other metro districts to get into some issues um, that didn't uh, think thoughtfully about that. So I appreciate that. And I do uh, really appreciate your um, explanation of this, of going into metro district land. I think that was some of the best uh, explanations you have. So, um, you know, and you don't have to be nice to the city attorney if you don't want to. You know, it's okay. We're still in metro district land. All right, any other comments? Seeing no other comments, uh, I'm gonna open the voting to approve uh, Resolution 55. The vote is seven in favor. The motion passes unanimously. Great, all right, thank you so much, Council. And I see the next item of business is ordinance and second readings. We have none. Uh, we have adjournment, and with no further business, we're adjourned at 8.49 p.m.